Thank you, Laron. And it's great to uh, have a chance to talk with you all this morning. Uh, Rob's going to be showing some great stuff. And just as a hint, don't lose the glasses. In fact, uh, you may want to start unwrapping the glasses before Rob gets up. <laughs> You're going to need them. So I'm going to go over a few things with regard to status of uh, variable fonts. Um, yeah, Tom, I'm not going to. You're not going to see me do anything interesting in 3D. Yeah. So I'll go over a few things. First, I'll talk a little bit about um, progression in the OpenType spec. So we released OpenType 1.8 uh, last September when we announced the uh, development of OpenType font variations uh, at A-Type I. And since then, we've done a minor update of the spec, OpenType 1.8.1 which just had some refinements of things that was we were working on implementations and, and seeing, OK, there's a few issues in the spec. So two key things. Uh, in the stat table, we recognized that there was actually a missing field that was really needed to make the stat table work the, in, the way that we intended. And so we created a version 1.1 of the stat table, deprecated the 1.0 version of the stat table, uh, deprecated before it ever actually got implemented. And then uh, working with the folks from Adobe to make a lot of refinement in the chapters regarding CFF2, uh, clarifying, uh, making some corrections. Then, uh, since then, I've been collecting uh, feedback, additional issues that need to be clarified in the text. So I've, I've got work in progress on another minor update. I don't have a specific time frame yet for when that'll come out, but probably sometime later this year. I'll be uh, making a minor update, of, again, with s some small changes. So I want to talk a bit about where we're at in the Windows 10 Creators update. So uh, we're releasing uh, a feature update of Windows 10 this month. In fact, this week, people are starting to, to get the Creators update. And uh, I didn't touch it, and it advanced. OK. <laughs> All right, is this, Dan, is this what was happening to you yesterday? So uh, I'll, I'll demo a few things. First of all, in this app, I've, this is a little app that I put together that is showing uh, the set of fonts installed on my system as DirectWrite is seeing them. And uh, so I've got, I've got here some, I have to find my cursor. So I've got some variable fonts installed here, the Avenir Next, variable font, uh, one that folks at Monotype have uh, put out on, on GitHub. Thanks for that. Um, so this is a font that is conforming to the OpenType 1.8.1 spec in every regard. So that's great. And I've got it installed my, on my system. DWrite is seeing um, all of the named instances in the font. A couple of other examples uh, coming down here. Celoic variations test. This is another one that's out on GitHub that we've made available for, uh, that we're using for some of our validation testing and implementations. Um, again, one font instead of named instances, and, and those are all presented in DWrite. And uh, then this one, Sitka FV. So we've got a font family that's been part of Windows for a while now, the Sitka family, that includes optical size variants. And Sitka FV is a prototype that Rob did uh, to re-engineer that family of fonts as a single variable font. And so again, um, DWrite is seeing all of these named instances and in including all of these optional size variants. Now, the, the functionality that we have in DirectWrite in the Creators Update is just using existing APIs that already existed. So, that's, so I'm seeing things through existing APIs. And that's going to be significant um, for what I talk about next. So I'll switch over. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of browsers. And these are existing apps that are using DWrite APIs. The apps have not been updated in any way at all. So this is Edge, and it's showing um, I've got these different samples of Avenir Next. Now, this is using local fonts, not, uh, not web fonts. Uh, but all of these named instances are appearing as you'd expect them to. And that's because 
you know, with, there weren't any updates in Edge. It's simply using DWrite APIs, and so the app doesn't even know that these are, in fact, variable fonts. They just appear like other fonts on the system, right? Again, it's the named instances. And uh, switching over to, to Chrome, same thing. This is uh, Chrome version 56. Again, it hasn't been changed at all. Uh, so everything is displaying okay on screen. I'll talk about print in a moment. Um, so I was, okay, I'm, I was going to give you a little demo, uh, just copying the text out of uh, the browser and pasting it into Word, and for some reason, Word isn't launching for me right now. So I'll just tell you, what you would have seen is that when I pasted the text into Word, it, it pasted in fine, except Word is a hybrid app. It uses DWrite for some things, but it's still using GDI for other things. And because it's still using GDI, it, it was displaying all of the Sitka uh, samples exactly formatted the way they should be, but the, the Anavir, Avenir Next samples, it was not getting the right selection of fonts. We've done some work in, in GDI to uh, make it work with named instances of variable fonts, but we're not quite as far along in GDI as we are in DWrite. And, and nothing wrong with the font, there's something that, uh, that GDI isn't getting quite right when it's reading that font. So if you were to install variable fonts in, in Windows 10 Creators Update, the uh, Things that relate to that, are, that use GDI, like the font control panel, there may be some issues there. If you look in DWrite, you're going to get uh, pretty good results. Uh, now, I talked about print, and so so from both of these browsers, I I printed out hard copy, and I've got hard copy I, I can show you, but it's sort of hard to show everybody in the room. So I've I've uh, captured the results of the print and pasted them into my presentation. And so I'll show you that. So this is the results from Edge in uh, screen and on print. Both of them are working as you'd expect. If I go over to Chrome, then the screen is working correctly, but the print results are not right. Now, this, I'm not, this is not to denigrate Chrome in any way. Uh, the results that you see here in Chrome, we had the same results in Edge just a, f a few months ago. If you look carefully at what's going on, you'll see that the positions of the glyphs are appropriate for the named instance. Right? Like that first line, Avenir Next Variable Condensed, those glyph positions are correct, it's just the outlines that are not right. What's happening is the, the app is seeing the, that instance of the font, and it's getting the right metric information, but when it sends information out to the printer, it's got the right metric information, but it's sending font data to the printer, and rasterization is happening on the printer, and the printer does not understand the variable font format. We can't assume, this is one thing that we knew going into developing the technology, we can't assume that printing pipelines will understand the new format. And so in fact, what we have to do when you go to print is at that time, um, generate a new font for that specific instance as a non-variable font and send that font data down to the printer. And so that's functionality that we have in, um, that, we've, that we have in the Windows platform, and Edge is relying on that functionality, but Chrome is not. Chrome has its own library, and that version of Chrome has not been updated uh, to have that functionality. Now, I know that the, the folks at Google have been working on, on uh, making variable fonts uh, work in Chrome, and so if you, if you looked at their uh, most recent builds, that, that may be working. Uh, this particular version was not. So that's something that you may see happen. Um, one thing to look out for, things may not work in printing pipelines if the application is using its own libraries for, for, doing, for handling the, the print workflow. Now I'll, I'll switch gears here and uh, show you this font. 
the deco of our font. So how many have, have, have taken a look at Decovar already? Right, so most people are familiar with it. This wild font that, uh, that David has put together. And here, DWrite is just animating through... Uh, it's not, you're not seeing it. There. Okay. So DWrite is just animating through uh, changing some of the axis values. And so all of this is being done with DWrite, except the, the public APIs that we have don't have a way of select, at this point, don't have a way of selecting arbitrary instances. And so we're using private APIs for doing the selection of the instances, but all the rendering is the, the rendering of, that's available in DWrite. Okay. So the other thing about, about Decovar, that stuff works. If I, if I come back into this app where I showed you the, the fonts that we see installed on the system, I come up and I look, and Decovar is not appearing here. So there's some, there's some things going on in Decovar that uh, didn't align with assumptions that we were making in our implementation. And that's an issue in our implementation that we need to, to work on. So, so the DecoR font has got a set of named instances, and it has a stat table. And the stat table is important for uh, being able to make variable fonts work in existing APIs and existing applications. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's got a stat table with access records, but it doesn't have access value tables. Um, and that's part of why it's not working quite right. And there's some things that we'll need to, to look at. So direct, direct write can, can render Decovar, but we have issues with enumerating the named instances. Um, GDI, GDI isn't seeing Decovar at all. It's not understanding it. So in summary, in the creator's update, we've got pretty good support in direct write for the named instances exposed through existing APIs, working in screen print PDF workflows. Um, but it's depending on having a stat table with access value tables to be able to know how to present the variable fonts in existing APIs for existing applications. We've done some work in GDI, but it, it's not quite a far, as far along as direct write is. So I want to talk in a little more detail about this stat table and the issues involved in supporting variable fonts in existing uh, software. We felt it was important that variable fonts could work to some degree in existing apps, because otherwise customers would install this font, but then uh, you know, they've been told that you've got all of these different fonts inside this one file, but then they go into some app and they only see one thing. Um, and we thought that wouldn't be a very good situation. Um, this, ke this keeps advancing on me. So I'll come back into this app in a minute. And I told you this is DirectWrite's view of all of the fonts that I have installed. In fact, I've done a little, um, I've added a little logic in my app that's not built into to DWrite. And where that plays out is in this particular case, that I see one Sitka family that has all of these named instances that include optical size variants. The existing DirectWrite APIs were um, developed a decade or so ago, built on a model that assumed a font family can have weight variations, and it can have width variations, and it can have italic or oblique, but anything else comprises a different font family. Right? There's lots of software that's been built around that assumption of what a font family can look like. And there's older software that was built around an assumption that a font family can only have regular, bold, italic, and bold italic. You know, all those apps that have a B and I button on them. Um, and uh, their own 
adequately, you know, appropriately raise the question, you know, maybe those things are past their expiration date. Um, so, but that's, those are constraints that those existing apps have, and we have to have a way of presenting the fonts in a way that fit those assumptions. Otherwise, those apps will only see some of the fonts that you have installed in your system. Now, this may sound familiar. Um, switch gears here. OK. So we've got these existing uh, apps, existing APIs that only understand these variations, weight, stretch, style. This, this is probably reminding you of this area that I know every font developer loves, which is uh, name table entries. Uh, we've got all of these pairs, name ID 1 and 2, 16, 17, 22, 23. And these name uh, family, subfamily pairings, the reason why you have multiple ones is to accommodate different software different applications that have different assumptions about what a font family can look like. And so you've all gone through an exercise where you've got, you're creating a new font, and you have to figure out what are all the right names to put in all these fields. And I have a couple of examples here that um, just call out some of the, the challenge, because Kronos Pro is like Sitka. It's got weight and optical size variations. But for exactly comparable things, you have to set the data a little differently because they handle the naming a little differently. It's all very confusing, and, and we understand that. And we hope that um, going forward, this will become simpler for you. Because in the world of variable fonts, you really only have one pair of name entries. In fact, in the variable font, when you have named instances, you do not have an equivalent of name ID 1 and 2 for the named instances. You don't have an equivalent of name ID 22 and 23 for the named instances. You only have name ID 16 and 17 equivalents. And so somehow we have to take that 16, 17 name pair and come up with equivalents of name ID 1 and 2 and 22 and 23. We have, to, we have to generate those inside our software implementation in the platform. So how do we do that? One thing that we knew right out, out front, we didn't want to go parsing those strings and trying to recognize certain tokens as, oh, well, that, that's a word that means bold, and that's a word that means condensed, and stuff like that. Instead, we thought, we want a way for the font developer to declare the pieces of the names that correspond to different access values that we can then use to reconstruct appropriate names for legacy applications. And so if we could have these pieces of information, that the weight 600 corresponds to a name of semibold, that optical size in this particular range corresponds to a name display, and that italic value of zero corresponds to normal or perhaps Roman, we could use that to reconstitute the names from 16 and 17 into names, uh, names 1 and 2, or 22 and 23. And so let's suppose you were wanting to get the, the, the typographic model of 16 and 17. That's fairly straightforward. If instead you wanted to get the equivalence of a, the GDI model, or, or the, the model that assumes only regular bold italic, bold italic, you would just, um, OK, you would just assemble those names in a different way to come up with a family name of Sitka display semi-bold. Or for applications that assume a weight width slope model of a font family, again, combine them in a different way. And so the stat table is providing the information that we need to be able to do that recomposition of names to project the names in ways that older applications will understand. So the, the stat table is describing each of the axes, giving it a relative ordering of how the, those axes should be reflected, and that can be used in assembling the names, and can also get used in creating UIs. 
but the important piece is being, having this information that uh, particular values on, on particular axes are associated with particular names. It's required for us to be able to support variable fonts in existing apps. And, and because of that, we have a policy in Windows that if we have a font that has an FR table, but it doesn't have a stat table, then in existing apps, we're only going to be able to, those apps will only be able to see one instance of the font, the, uh, the default instance. And so, in effect, we will treat that not as a variable font. We'll treat it as a, a conventional non-variable font, in spite of the fact that it has an FR table. So make sure to, to include a stat table in your fonts. Now, I'll come back to what I was saying earlier with regard to the Decovar font. It does have a stat table with access records, but it doesn't have any access value tables. And we're confronted with the question like, well, what name would you give to uh, the terminal C axis having a value of 750? Because in, in the named instances of the Decovar font, that's one particular value that's relevant. Uh, well, so to, to show you what I'm referring to here, so uh, terminal C, right. So this axis is giving you these rounded serifs. And a value of 750 is you now somewhere about there. And so the question is, what name would you give to that in contrast to this, or this, or this? Well, there's no obvious name that you could come up with. And so we realized in retrospect that as we had been thinking about this, all through the time that we were developing the, the spec for variable fonts, that we were assuming conventional uh, families, uh, conventional axes that we're familiar with, like weight, like width, like optical size, that are so commonly used, but not really thinking carefully through cases like Decovar that would have a bunch of weird, unconventional axes. So there's more work that we're going to need to do to think about fonts like that as we think about what the stat table is doing, it's, in, it's primarily intended to accommodate legacy and uh, hopefully avoid future legacy. But f when we're, we're mapping names into these old family models, it's really specifically weight and width axes and then optical, italic rather, and oblique values that are significant for older software, for those older font family models. And then what's significant in the case of Decovar is it is not using any of those, right? And so there's actually a simple solution that we'll put into our implementation that, okay, we don't try to, everything that appears in the named instances of Decovar is treated in those older font family models like a distinct family. Okay, that's a simple thing to, to do. If somebody were to create a Decovar font, that included a weight axis, that's when we would have a problem. We wouldn't, the, the uh, data structures that exist in the stat table today wouldn't give us a way to come up with those names. And so I'm really curious to know how likely are we to see fonts like that? Fonts that have some set of unconventional axes that, uh, that don't lend themselves to giving uh, names to points upon the, uh, along the axis that then get assembled together to create a, a full face name, combined with axes like weight or width that are like that. 100%? Yeah, OK. OK. No, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, I figured that was probably going to happen. So, um, so one thing, just a final comment about uh, this whole stat table business. Um, with regard to weight, width, and italic, 
because these things are relevant for these older APIs uh, and how we have to remap the names, I uh, would suggest that, well, first of all, if you use these axes in your variable fonts, make sure to include axis value subtables within your stat table so that we have that information. But I'd also recommend that when you are creating the, uh, the instance names, that you put the tokens for weight or width um, or italic or oblique, make those the last thing in the name. Because when we reorder pieces, it will be the least disruptive to take something from the end to take, in effect, you're chopping something off the end of that family name uh, and putting everything else at the, into the family name. If you had those in the middle, then it would be more disruptive. So do Sitka display semi-bold, not Sitka semi-bold display, is basically what I'm saying. OK. so. Switching gears now, talk a little bit about some uh, steps going forward. I've talked about the state of our implementation in the Windows 10 Creators update. We'll have another feature update for Windows 10 later this year. And um, in this update, we will be adding new APIs in, in DirectWrite to be able to support this notion of, of font families that can have any number of axes of variation and to be able to select arbitrary instances. Um, I know people are interested in what our plans are around Edge. Uh, we're not announcing anything specifically about Edge yet. They've been, they've been waiting on us to provide the, the new APIs in DirectWrite. So that's what we're starting to work on right now. We've also been uh, really privileged to uh, have partnership with Adobe. Uh, appreciate their help in working on getting the CFF uh, rasterizer updated to support CFF2, and we're expecting that that will be included in this update, uh, this next update uh, of Windows appearing later this year. And then aside from uh, the stuff that we're doing in the platform, we're also working on a diagnostic tool. So there was mention yesterday of a font view tool that Sasha uh, put together, and uh, you did that, right? Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's a tool that people can use on, on the Mac or on, uh, on Linux. Uh, we're doing equivalent tool that you can use on Windows to see how your variable fonts will render in DirectWrite or in GDI. But it, we're also thinking of it as a diagnostic tool. We want to be providing some diagnostic information. So if you see something that isn't quite what you expect, we want to provide information to tell you, well, this is how things got calculated. This is how your data got interpreted that led to that result, so that you have some clues as to what may be going on and what you might need to fix. Or possibly, you may discover that there seems like the bug in, in your implementation, and you can let us know. Ah. OK, I'm sorry, folks, I have to restart here. What a, OK, I think I'm trying to remember. What was next while well, that's doing that? So Okay. All right. Thinking about the open type spec, uh, we want to continue evolving on that. There's some longer term possibilities for how the spec could evolve uh, that we've had some discussion with uh, other partners about. These are, there are some things that will be significant changes. They'll take a little more work to, to think through, things like uh, coming up with perglyph variations that could be used in building up composites, right? So describing the components with your composite as a, um, some variation in some glyph-specific variation space. Uh, there's nearer-term things that can be done to extend the spec. And in particular, I'll call out the possibility of having new registered axes. So there's been interest expressed in some new uh, registered axes. 
so we've had some conversations around grade. Uh, Frank Blochlin has uh, suggested the idea of a spacing axis. And there's some, I think, uh, some open questions as to what would be good axes. So for instance, the idea, uh, Dave's got this idea that we really need a new weight axis that is more, um, more tied to the actual structure of the glyphs um, so that you're actually giving real measures like the numbers represent real measures of stroke thickness, right? Um, a sort of a very low-level approach. Now, in Liron's talk yesterday, she talked about how bold or emphasis has uh, a, a culturally determined interpretation, right? What is, what is considered bold in one culture is different from what is considered bold in another culture. So maybe, maybe you might like to have more higher-level axes described at more semantic level. I don't know. The idea of registered axes is a playground for you folk to, uh, to be thinking about. The one thing that I, from my perspective, I would say is that um, wider adoption of a registered axis is better. I, would, I think it would be better to have fewer registered axes that are used more often and that customers can get familiar with than to have a lot of of registered axes, each of which is used in only a few fonts or maybe supported only in a few applications. So things for you guys to be thinking about. Uh, we want to have some process for defining a registered axis. So that's something that I'm working on for the next version of the uh, OpenType spec. Been refactoring some of the, the content to lend itself better to uh, adding new registered axes. I've, I've come up with a set of categories of information that I think are essential for defining a new axis. And so if you want to propose something, uh, then really you need to come up with this set of documentation. And then we need to have some chance for people to review and come to consensus that, yeah, that's a good way to, to define an axis. And it's also good to, uh, if you're going to want to propose something, to have a demo font. So I know in Frank's case, he's put together a, a, a demo font of a spacing axis that just really helps to communicate to everybody else, what does this mean? So um, in that case, I've, I've come up with a straw man proposal of, you know, this is the information you would want for proposing uh, a spacing axis. Uh, Frank has uh, posted on uh, type drawers with regard to that, so invite people to start providing uh, comments and feedback on that. So that's the, the topics I wanted to cover. I'm going to hand it off to Rob. Hello, everyone. I love variable fonts. Who else loves variable fonts? Woo! Yeah, yeah, good, good. We got a lot of interest in, in variable fonts. What I love about variable fonts is that they open up a whole lo load of possibilities that we've never had before. I agree with Dan Radigan yesterday, who said that I think the, the web is going to be the first main place that we see variable fonts take off. People are going to just take responsive design to a whole new level by combining CSS grids and variable fonts and start doing cool things with fitting text and adjusting widths and stuff when you go to a phone versus being on a desktop. But that's all just kind of repackaging fonts. That's just the whole idea of a typeface family in a single file. And I, I think that's kind of a limiting idea. I think we can do more. We can go beyond that. And I, there's a lot of ideas that are already cooking out there. John Hudson's going to talk tomorrow about ways of using variable fonts to solve layout and shaping problems for complex scripts. Uh, we talked about the spacing axis already. Um, David's creating these crazy fonts that blow people's minds and uh, preconceptions. And as Peter highlighted, we're, you know, that's caused a lot of thinking and rethinking at Microsoft. But I want to go even further. I want to take advantage of it. We have an, a, an active medium, right? It's got processors, sensors, the, you know, the internet. It's got animations. We can take advantage of this thing and go way beyond typography of the past and the kind of still lifeless typography of a printed page and go on to something that's really dynamic and interesting. And, and, and so what I want to do is walk through a couple examples of using variable fonts in a completely different way than we have been using before to kind of get the creative juices flowing and thinking. We're going to look at the human visual system, um, your visual cortex, and look at how can we use variable fonts to help people with that most basic thing of reading. 
So I'm going to go through a lot of science really, really fast because we're also a little bit uh, over time. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail on the uh, science like my colleague Kevin Larson might. If you want more, come find me afterwards. I'm happy to talk about more detail on that. I also will say that all this stuff I'm going to talk about, I've never tried. Like, you guys are first. Uh, so don't know if it's going to work, but, you know, we're, gonna, we're just brainstorming here. And the last thing is, because all of these things, I don't know if they're going to work. There's no product announcements here, no product plans. Big hand wave is going on right now. So with all that said in mind, let's go have some fun. So I think you all have seen this before, uh, know the basic architecture of the eye. Light comes in uh, through the iris, goes through the lens, projects on the retina of your eye. The retina is made up of two kinds of cells that are photosensors. There's rods, which are really low resolution sensors that only give you black and white. And there are cones, which are very uh, precise photosensors that give you color. The cones are what matter when you're reading. It's not that the color that, uh, sensitivity that matters, in fact, with all the processing that goes on in your eye, you actually read mostly in black and white, despite what the colors of the text are. If you want more information on that, I'll tell you later. Uh, don't have time right now. It's the precision of rods or of cones that matters, and that's what's interesting to us. Now, the cones are not spread throughout the retina in an even fashion like you would have in a uh, camera sensor. If you look at the blue line there. They're really, really concentrated in the middle. Like, if you look in the dead center, there's like 150,000. Uh, so sensors per square millimeter. It's like really dense. But if you only go one degree out, you're down to 40,000 or 50,000 uh, sensors. You've lost two thirds of your resolution already. And if you just go five more degrees out, you're already at 20,000. You've lost 90% of your resolution. So that's a bunch of numbers. And like, how do we, what, is this, what does this mean? So everybody, stick your thumbs out like this. Give me, a, give me a thumbs up. Everybody, thumbs up. Okay. This is about the width of two degrees. So if you look at something, like look at you know, somebody there or something up close or something up far, get a sense of how big that is. That, if you could turn off your brain and your eye, uh, other processing, that's all you'd see in focus. And then if you go like one, two thumbs out, that's the five degrees. Out there, you've lost 90% of your resolution. So what does that mean for typography? That's what it means. It means the center, if I, if, if I took a moment of time when your eyes fixated and still, You'd see very clearly in the center, but it goes blurry really, really, really fast. Um, and so that clear area in the middle, it's got a name. This is the visual span. This is the part of what you're looking at that your, your attention, your brain is actively looking at. It's decoding uh, the, the letter forms, it's decoding words, that type of thing. Beyond that, you have the perceptual span. Now, this area, you're not actually attending to. Your attention's not there, you're not paying attention. It's kind of pre-attentive. It's kind of starting to prime your brain for the letters that you're about to get. So it's kind of putting you in the mood of that J or the mood of that uh, U, so that when you do jump 250 milliseconds later, it's sharp, you understand it, it's primed, you, you recognize it faster. And then in the distance, we have really blurry things. We just really use that for planning each jump of our eye. So how do we learn this? How do we know this is the case? In 1975, there was a paper published by uh, Rayner and McConkie. Um, they did an experiment called a moving window experiment. What they did is they had people sit in front of a screen hooked up to a computer, which was hooked up to an eye tracker, and then they just had them read a sentence. But the sentence didn't look like this. It looked like this. What they did is they X'd out all of the letters except for right where you were looking. So let's get a sense of what that feels like. So let's go ahead and read this. So the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So that's what people would experience. And what they did is they changed the number of characters that you could see at a time. And they found, you know, if you had one character at a time, you read really slowly. That's really hard. And then you go two characters, three characters. And your reading speed goes up nice and linear up until about 15 characters. Beyond that, it just plateaus, right? You don't see anything. And that's it, that 15 character percep or perceptual span that we talked about before. Now, one of the things I think is really cool about this is the person in the head tracker didn't see the X's. If you have the, the span out to 15 characters, they don't see the X's. Every time they look at something different that we change the letters, you don't see the X's. If I have a whole page of text like this and also change you know, the letters for adjacent rows, then the person in the eye tracker sees a normal page. Someone outside the eye tracker is going to see a bunch of X's with a little flickery bit wherever the person is looking. But the person in the eye tracker sees the whole page. So can we use this interesting thing with the other stuff to fix this problem. Can we use variable fonts so that we have a nice book typeface in the middle where it's clear, and out in the edges, in the periphery, do some changes to the letter forms so that they're more visible in this area that we know is really low resolution, really blurry. 
Theoretically, this could increase the, uh, the efficiency of the perce uh, perceptual span and therefore increase the speed of your reading. But if we decide to do this and tweak the, the letter forms out in the edges, what's going to be our design principle for this? Remember, this is the problem we're combating, right? In the center, you've got a lot of resolution. The cones are very, very close together. It would have to be a really tiny letter form feature to fit between two cones so that you couldn't see it, right? That's, you just, these are packed dense. You don't really lose anything there. But you go out in the periphery, and then, you know, it, just, it doesn't take much to get a letter form fi feature that fits in between cones, and you're not going to see that. It's going to get blurred out. And if you go way out into the countryside of your retina, whole letters could land between cones, and you're not going to see those. So what we want to do, essentially, is take all these letter, feature, letter form features that are easy to see in the center and make them big. So I'm glossing over a whole lot of stuff. Like I said, the science I'm not going into. Um, the way optometrists and scientists think about the level of detail you can see is in spatial frequency. And this is a slide for those of you who went to Sao Paulo um, that Kevin Larson presented, where along the bottom we see kind of the level of detail and along the top the level of contrast. Uh, it's called spatial frequency. This is the actual basis I use to do all the things, the horrible things I'm going to do in a few minutes. Um, but I just don't have time, so I won't uh, go into it. But know that this is where it all came from. So we want to make things better. One of the simplest things we could do is to just have a line of text and then make the things in the periphery bigger, right? That, that kind of makes sense because, you know, then there, we've made everything bigger and you can resolve it. So let's see what that would look like. So here we are going to read it. So we're on the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy, well, I was too lazy to finish it, but um, anyway, you get the kind of sense of what this would feel like, make it nice and big. This should work, right? This makes a lot of sense, right? Well, it doesn't. Turns out these guys, Mie and uh, O'Donnell, Serrano, uh, a few years ago tried this out and they found no reading speed difference between this and just reading a normal line of text. They found that the saccade distance was the same number of characters in the big as the small. And if you read their paper, they're kind of puzzling over this, like, this should work, why doesn't it work? One of the things they're thinking about is when you have these big giant letters, your saccades are much longer. And it's known that when you have long saccades, you tend to over, un, undershoot and have to do another saccade to get to where you're supposed to go. So that second extra saccade might be masking our performance. As a typographer, I also wonder, like, I mean, we've changed, there's no baseline in this, right? They center aligned everything. And then there's, you know, other things going on. Like, there's, this is weird. So there might be some other effects that are going on. So, you know, but this is what you'd expect. A lot of, you know, psychologists, they take Courier and Arial, throw it in a study and they report the results. And hey, it's good, right? We're typographers, we're type designers, we can do more. So what I want to do is play with this idea, but in the periphery, keep things on the original metrics. So we don't have long saccades, keep it natural uh, movement. So let's start, let's begin. So here is Sitka text as we ship it in the operating system right now. I'm going to do horrible things to it. So warning for those of you who are a little queasy, or especially John Hudson, Ross Mills, and Mike Duggan, please look away, I'm going to destroy your work. And Matthew, please, Forgive me. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to leave that up there for reference. Put another copy down here so we can start doing things to it. So one of, like I said, one of the simplest things you can do is just to make things bigger. In the Latin alphabet, the lowercase is the most important, so we want to make that big in particular. But like we said before, we want to keep on to the same metrics. So I just took the X height, blew it all the way up to the cap height. Right? Let the ascenders and descenders just fly into the, uh, to, the, uh, to the letting. That's okay because if you set this in a normal book type setting, remember the above and below lines are normal sized, so you're not going to get too much classing, clashing. Plus, this takes those important extenders and makes them very, very prominent. So I think this is an interesting idea. What else can we do? Well, let's see. We've got all these letter form features. Can we make letter form features bigger? Right? We're trying to make everything bigger. Everybody remember this study? It was done by Fisett in 2008 when it was published. What they did is they took letters and blurred all the details out except for one little spot and then asked people to guess what the letter is. And then they kept score and the spots that got the most right answers are what they highlighted in red there. And so if you look, um, you've got like, you know, the lowercase a, the aperture on the a is important. You look at the lowercase c, well, the aperture on the c is important. You know, on lowercase e, that crossbar is important, right? So let's look at our typeface here. Can we take those typeface features, and I'm thinking of it in terms of a typeface designer paying attention to negative space. The psychologists haven't think, thought through that yet, but oh well. Um, and okay, yes, I've cranked them up. So the A and the E you see now have huge apertures, and I've moved the uh, crossbar on the E down to get it away from the other features so that they don't land on the same cone. They, there's hopefully some extra space between them. 
So that's one cool thing that we can do. Let's go a bit further. Like all those thin strokes, I know this is a, a text typeface, so it's not got a lot of stroke contest, but those thin features can still disappear. So let's just get rid of those two and boost it all up. Now we have a nice monolinear version of Sitka. And so there we are. We've got a nice version of uh, Sitka that's optimized for the periphery and low resolution viewing. If you think about what we just did, it's not that far off from what you normally do designing an optical small. We increased the X height, we lowered the contrast, we increased the apertures, we you know, moved uh, the counters around. The only thing we didn't do is increase the width and the, and the spacing, which we've already constrained ourselves deliberately on that, so that was intentional. To me, I think that's interesting. I love it when two different schools of thought, starting with different bases, come up with the same answer, because you know, yeah, we've known about it for 500 years, thank you for catching up, but um, that's cool that they came together like that. So now we've got two masters. We've got Sitka as it normally is, and uh, that should be the mangled version <laughs> of my typeface over there, not Helvetica uh, or Ariel. Um, but oh well, uh, pretend it is. Um, forgot to install that font on your computer, sorry. <laughs> then we put an axis on there. I'm calling this the para-axis for parafolvio, which is that kind of blurry region that we're talking about. The axis values I use in the center, I use zero degrees, and this is the angle that uh, things are off from center. So I put five degrees out for my other master. And so what does that look like? Looks like this. Now I've cheated a little bit. On the extremes, I actually boosted those up another 150%, just so it's really, really obvious on the screen. But um, you know, that's just for visual purposes. So let's see how this works. Let's put this in our eye tracking reader and see how this feels. So let's start this, and we'll just read it. So modern, eccentric reading methods captivate. I think that has some potential. It feels a little bit more natural than you know, before. Sure, it's a little goofy and you see things going up and down, but the way the eye trackers work, when you move your eye, we can change that before you see it. And remember, we're talking about the periphery where your attention is not there yet. So let's look at comparison. So bottom of the screen is Sitka text in a totally normal type setting. Top is you know, my type setting like that. But this is how text appears in the front of your eye on the screen. What's more interesting is what's it look like inside your eye? And so what I've done here is put the blurring back on everything. So we can compare a normal type setting at the bottom to a type setting like this that you'd see in a moment of time in our cool eye tracking reader. And I think it has some potential. When you get out to the, the edges there, you can parse those uh, uh, letters on, on, the, on the extremes a little bit more than you can here. Uh, untested, don't know if it works, but you know, we'll see how it works. But it's just an interesting way of using variable fonts automatically in the consumption experience to help people improve their reading experience without them having to know, you know what an optical size is and you know, doing all these different things. So that's one idea. And then we'll move on now to a completely different idea. We, we're just in the eyes, and the signal in your eyes goes through your brain, a bunch of white matter lands in the back of your head right here, which I'm afraid to touch because there's all these wires in my head right now. Um, but right in the back of your head, that's where your visual cortex is. There's an important property of the vision system that I want to talk about that I need to dispel a myth. Like, it's really easy when you're sitting here looking around and you kind of get this picture in front of you and you kind of have this idea in the back of your head that there's this picture in your head, you know, like the movie Inside Out. Like, there's this screen and people are sitting there watching it and, well, okay, maybe I have people in my head, but... Um, Anyway, that's, that's total fiction, right? It feels like there's a screen in your head, but actually the vision system, the way it works, each stage does a lot of compression and chunking of information and passing it up to the next stage. If you remember Sampo's talk yesterday and he talked about convolution neural networks, that's where the idea came from. Like if you look, it has this whole cascading hierarchy of higher and higher level features, and that's how this works. So your eye chunks a bunch of stuff, sends it back, so on. There's never any time in your brain where this screen, this view that you're looking at is reconstructed. What you're seeing and this feel, this is an illusion. And the more you get into vision science, the more you find out that what you see doesn't really exist. But anyway, what's interesting here is that once it gets to the visual cortex, it starts splitting. There are two pathways that visual information takes. One is it goes through a higher pathway called the dorsal pathway. Low resolution information goes up through there for spatial processing, motion processing, that type of thing. Information also goes down to a lower pathway called the ventr uh, ventral pathway. That's high resolution information, which is used for object recognition. These two pathways go out and then they come back together in a place called the visual word form area. That's right about here, kind of on the inside. That's the place, like the name says, where you actually recognize words. 
And so those two things come together to help you with that. Let's kind of walk through how that works. So the ventral pathway, just recognize, you know, uh, letter recognition's already happened at this point, but there's no order to things. You know, the ventral pathway just says, hey, I got an L and an E and an L and an H and an O. There they are, right? And that doesn't really tell you what the word is. The dorsal pathway, remember, gives you low resolution but spatial information and ordering. So that brings the thing and says, I got this kind of boxy tall thing and I got a dark round sort of thing and I got a couple of tall things and then I got this other round thing. And the visual word form area takes these two bits of information, combines them together and goes, hello, I got a word. That's cool. I think it's interesting seeing how the brain kind of divides up the task of things and then brings it back together. What's interesting is that dorsal pathway. In dyslexics, it works differently. We don't know why, this is very cutting edge science, we don't know if it's faster or slower or weaker or stronger or it's delayed in time or whatever. What we are starting to see is in that visual word form area, the dorsal information comes in and doesn't really give that, that information about the order that the letters are coming in. So kind of as a gross illustration, kind of a simplification, let's look at this again from the path, uh, idea of a dyslexic. So again, the ventral pathways work in totally normal, works just like everybody else. There's a bunch of letters, L, E, L, H, O. But the dorsal pathway, all the letters kind of land in a jumble. They don't have an order to them. And that's why dyslexics have to really focus in on each letter at a time, one letter at a time, or maybe two, maybe three or four. And in fact, if you remember that moving window experiment from the beginning with the X's, if you run that experiment on a dyslexic, their visual spans only about four characters. A normal reader is seven. This is why. They don't have ordering information. So can we use variable fonts to fix this or to help people with this? If you remember that um, the dorsal pathway is also responsible for motion, maybe one thing we can do is add motion to letters in the order of things to help stimulate extra the dorsal pathway. So here's one idea. This is just animating through the letters using a uh, variable font with a weight axis and just animating through the weight axis. Uh, works really nicely on this typeface, which is a duplex typeface. This is MS1451, which will ship someday. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it just goes through there. Nice, simple, easy to do. Here's another idea. So, there we go. So this is an idea that's interesting for primary school students who are still learning to write. It also gives a really strong motion signal. Um, so that's interesting. This is also a variable font. This variable font has a time axis and it just animates through it from zero to 100. Okay, I lied. It's actually this, <laughs> this particular font. Um, I decided it would be useful for the default instance to have the fully formed letters. So if you loaded up a document or you load up the font in some other app, you could still read some text. Um, so what I did is I put, the fully formed letters at the default, put that at zero, and put the unformed letters at 100, and then animate backwards through time. Um, and then later realized, wait, I could have just made the default 100 and went forward through it. Um, I'll fix that next version. And so this is what it looks like when I was making the thing uh, using glyphs. There's the fully formed version there at, uh, at zero. At 100, everything's collapsed, so there's nothing present. And then I use brace layers on the side there to basically make keyframes for my animation and form out the character. The nice way, the thing about this is I can use a different number of keyframes for each letter. I don't have to use, standardize this across the font. That ends up being intermediate uh, variation data in, in the font for each character. The other handy thing is that I can just change the coordinate of each of these keyframes and it gives me a nice control over the time as it moves through there. So that's one way we can stimulate the dorsal pathway to get some stuff, but there's another way that we could use. Remember the dorsal pathway is responsible for spatial information including depth. How can we use depth in typography? I wonder. Oops. So I'll let you get your glasses on and uh, get used to this. Hopefully it works. I've never tried this in a full auditorium before. Um, I think I also need to take a picture of you guys. <laughs> this is great. Okay, here we go. There we go. One picture over here. I love it. Welcome to the 1950s. <laughs> so, one of the things you could do is, uh, you know, anyone who's worked with me before knows that I'm very, very interested in using depth in typography as an information hierarchy element and other things, and playing with the cognitive difference between depth and other typographic elements. We're not using depth in this case for hierarchy, we're using it for uh, dyslexia and using it for a spatial cue. 
So does everybody see this pretty well? They actually get you know, the depth. I know about 10% of you do not have stereopsis, so sorry. Um, but people are seeing the 3D should pop out a little bit. Typography pops out a little bit in, in there. We have some people yes and no. OK, well, hopefully it works on the next. So here's one idea of helping out the dyslexics. I'll give you a second to look at that and get used to it. Um, the way this is set up, in each word, the first letter is very close to you or closer to you. The last letter is farther away, and there's a progression away from that. Um, hopefully, you see that. I did make it kind of subtle because I was afraid of if I made it too extreme, people would get sick. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's what's going on in that one. Here's another idea. Oh, there it goes. So that was a little weird. I want to fix this so it's got more of a wave instead of this letter poking out at you. But you can still see how you could get a strong signal of, of motion and movement and, and depth with this that might be able to help. Now, I have no idea if this actually will help dyslexics. Um, you know, I think it will. It's based on some science. But if it doesn't, I have a 3D font. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is kind of cool. Um, and it, the nice thing about it is it's really easy to use and CSS and so on. So how did I make this thing? So now it'll probably work to take off these things so you can actually see the illustration. Um, this is a color font using the COLR font format. The nice thing about the COLR table is it's completely orthogonal to the variable font stuff. You can take a variable fonts axis, add a color table. You can take a color font, add variations to it really nicely. What this is, is it's Selowick. It, every character has two uh, color layers. One's red, one's cyan. Um, one, you know, and they're displaced like this. Then I've added a depth axis. And at one end, You've got the left character, it's 150 font units to the left of center, and you've got the cyan character, 150 units to the right, and then they just switch places as you go from one end of the depth axis to the other, so that in the middle, they're perfectly registered, and that's the plane of the screen. And so this is nice and easy. You can just put, throw the, all this stuff I just showed you was in HTML, and um, you just throw that in there, change the, uh, uh, the variation setting, and you get it popping up forward. It also helps to have a few other things on the screen that are in the plane of the cameras because sense of depth is actually a relative sense, not a depth, uh, an absolute sense. That's why there are all these gray boxes and stuff on the other demos. But while I'm talking about 3D, I want to get a quick pitch. If you haven't put your head in a VR or AR system and looked for about three or four hours at how fonts render and how text and reading is, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Go do it. It's, it'll be very valuable to you. Um, I know there's some people who think that all the fonts have ever been made or have been made and we're just rehashing things. We've got a brand new medium here. I think there's a lot of potential for variable fonts. So stick your head in one of these things and try it out because I think there's a lot of cool stuff coming up. So, those were a few ideas for how you can use variable fonts in completely different ways than the usual weight, width, and optical size, right? We had an acuity axis. We had a depth axis. We had some animations. We had some spatial displacement. I'm sure there's a ton of other possibilities. What is exciting to me about variable fonts is the, all these opportunities that it creates. You notice in this, you know, sure, I, there was an AR and VR, and we talked about those sorts of things, but these were Variable fonts that were used automatically. People didn't need to know how to use them or need to know what width is and optical size and all these things. It just happened automatically. They didn't even have to reach for a control. I think it's useful to think about things this way. But I, there, I think there's a ton of other things that we can do out there. I'm, I'm very interested in what your guys' ideas are. You're a very creative bunch, and I just wanted to do this to get you guys thinking through it. So keep your thinking about new ideas. Keep putting together axis proposals. Peter outlined a you know, methodology for proposing registered axes. When you do think about a new axes and new variable font features, I have a request. Think through it, not just to what would a typographer do with it? What would a graphic designer do with it? What would be an advanced user doing with this? Go a step further. Maybe there's some little thing you can do to figure out that this cool feature how you can enable it so it's automatically applied for everyone, people who are not typographically savvy, people who use the default font, right? Like all these things that we saw here, we're all about using, you know, uh, automatically applied. Think about how you can do it because, you know, variable fonts have such interesting potential. Why would you limit it to just a few graphic designers and typographers when you can do a little extra thing and it works for the world? And people who are accountants and other people who don't know anything about design, suddenly their documents look way cooler and prettier and they didn't do anything different and they don't know why, but they're cooler, right? Take that extra step. I find it's useful, even if you don't end up going there, um, to, f to, to thinking things thr through and realizing what you can do and helping a lot of people. So anyway, thank you very much. That's my spiel.